Today's episode is with Rob Raposo and Kayla Maynard. They have a wonderful family with three kids. Um, Rob works as a firefighter in Fort McMurray, and Kayla raises the kids like a boss. They have a coffee company called Brave Fox Coffee. Now, this isn't sponsored or anything, but I want you to check them out, bravefoxcoffee.com. Um, learn more about them. They ship all over the place, especially North America. And so it's something that's accessible to most of my listeners. We talked about things like eating disorders, um, raising children with, uh, with just different abilities in learning and understanding. And we talked about therapy. And we talked about meditation. We talked about uh, living away or working away from where you live. There's a lot of topics covered. Um, we're right now in the middle of a pandemic and this episode was recorded today. So if you are finding yourself frustrated or defeated, you're not alone. And I really enjoyed this episode, so I hope you do too. Thanks for listening. Welcome to the Lifestyle Chase Season 2. This podcast features high performers who have found a way to live their best life while balancing their health, wellness, friends, and family. I'm your host, Chris Little. Let's get started. The Lifestyle Chase is brought to you by Yeg Fitness. Yeg Fitness is Edmonton, Alberta, Canada's healthy lifestyle community, creating and supporting active living for all. Check them out online at yegfitness.ca and on social media at Yeg Fitness. So welcome to episode 107 of The Lifestyle Chase. I am joined by Rob Raposo and Kayla Maynard. Did I say your guys' names right? That's yeah, perfect. Yeah. yeah. Sweet view. <laughs> How are you guys <laughs> doing today? How did your morning start? Oh, it's been, uh, obviously, it's been an interesting week or so. I just got back from work uh, Tuesday night. Yeah, Tuesday. Tuesday night. So it's been nice easing back into, you know, being in the house, but with the sure buddy with the with the kids off school obviously uh you know there's there's a lot going on we're trying to uh trying to teach them and uh trying to get the school stuff going on but it's uh it's a little harder and we had uh, some appointments this morning so and then some video appointments kind of just like this so i mean every appointment is a video appointment these days hey yeah absolutely that was uh, and that's what we did last week with our kids too they had a psychology appointment and so we just did just did facetime and and it worked okay, but it's better than, you know, it's, it's all you can do. So, yeah. Um, what was your first initial reaction when it came down to the point where everybody had to be like socially distanced, socially isolated, whatever they we were all staying home. What was your first reaction? Oh, it was, uh, it was kind of a slow build up, I think, because in the back of my mind, I, I kind of thought we may be going this way, but at the same time, like, every, I mean, everything came down Sunday, but on like, you know, the Tuesday or Wednesday, I was like, ah, you know, this is whatever. It'll be okay. We'll kind of just shut down a few things. It'll be fine. But the schools are open, so everything's okay. And then I remember watching the news as, as they announced on Sunday. We were all standing around. And the kids, you could see they kind of just got a little slower, a little bit apprehensive. And then Kayla and I were thinking, oh, man, they're going to be home all the time now. How are we going to do this? And and it really didn't sink in until a couple of days later, you know, when they're not going to school. Like at first I was kind of like, ah, whatever, we get to spend all day together. We'll go outside, you know, we'll, we'll hang out with my parents. It'll be all okay. But, but that isn't how it went. And, and then I went to work and that was probably the hardest, hardest time. Cause so I work away, I work a week on and a week off. So when I, when I left, it was, uh, yeah, it was a really, really hard week and a hard week for, for the kids. So yeah, and we're just adapting by the day. So what first got you into your line of work? What inspired you to get into that in the first place? Well, I, uh, I foolishly wanted to become a, a cop. So that was kind of my uh, out of high school idea that it would be, you know, kind of something cool. And, and there was this, there was this uh, program when I was upgrading. Because after high school, didn't know what I wanted to do. My marks were okay, but I was kind of like, oh, I think I just want to go to university because that's what everybody does, right? You just get a degree and then you get a mortgage and then you die. But uh, as I looked into it more, um, I was able to take a course that kind of previewed fire, EMS, and police. And it was awesome because it gave me a chance to see that police work was not what I wanted to do. And then the first time I had bunker gear on, the first time I had an SCBA on, the first time I was actually moving around 
uh, doing some fire related tasks. I was like, Oh, this is like, it just gave me such a high. And then I'm all, I've always kind of been in the department of like, I enjoy helping people just, you know, that's kind of a general thing that we both uh, enjoy, but yeah, once I had bunker gear on, it was, that was it. And then I kind of just, everything I did was, was to get the career. So, you know, my, my ultimate dream was, oh, I want to work for Edmonton Fire. That was, that was my only funnel. And, you know, I applied, I didn't get on. And then I was like, okay, I'll do my EMT. So I did my EMT, went through that. That was really unique. I got to go to Baton Rouge, Louisiana a couple years after Katrina hit um, and did my practicum there. So that was, that was a very interesting experience. And then when I came back, you know, I kind of started opening my eyes a little more to the to the industry, realizing that there is more departments to work for. And I've been with the same department for 13 years now. We're a fire EMS uh, department, so you kind of get the best of both worlds. So with that, uh, you talked about that experience that you had um, down south. Uh, what was the biggest lesson that you learned from that? Um, it's a different world, just in the fact that, like, it's just a different, you know, just different society, different area, different country. Um, one of the biggest things that made me appreciate was our healthcare system, because not saying they have a bad healthcare system, they have a great one. It's just one of the things you would ask people was, you know, what what hospital were you going to because of what what insurance did you have? And that's just not something you do here, right? So it was just a big eye opener because you always hear about how the states has a different healthcare system, but. When you really uh, see firsthand that there is the differences based on uh, your income or your insurance or employment, uh, it really makes you appreciate what we have. So that was eye opening. So for any given week, and we'll go with you one at a time. But what is your like non-negotiables for the week? The things that you need to happen in order to sort of stay sane and balanced, and especially going into like this whole pandemic situation. I imagine those things are more imperative now than ever. Absolutely. I think this week has been uh, a test on everything or the past two weeks, whatever. I would say for me, and I've only learned this in the past couple of years, meditation is is huge for me. I need to do that every morning and generally every night. Um, workouts, I got to just absolutely crush a workout and have a good sweat um, or not feeling good. Yoga and then time with the family, whether that be on FaceTime when I'm at work or, or uh, at home. And I'm, when I say time with the family, I mean like a non-chaotic hour if it can happen no. yeah <laughs> um for me it's definitely waking before the kids like having that hour before they wake before i hear those little feet jump on the floor um and sitting in silence to have a coffee i do try to meditate as often as i can but a lot of times as soon as the coffee grinder starts one of them is waking up so that doesn't really happen um, I have to work out every day. Mentally, that's what really pushes me and drives me to get through my days at home with the kids alone. Um, and eating foods that's good for my body. Foods that really make me feel good about just how I feel. And getting good sleep. Getting sleep. I need sleep. We, yeah, we've just and got our really kids in the past them. while to, to actually sleep. We had a couple, couple rough years. So we realize that everything focuses back on sleep. So if we can get them sleeping and us sleeping, the world is just a better place and you can handle it. But when you're running off at two hours of sleep and then they wake up and then two hours of sleep, just nothing can ever go right. It's a, it's a very hard world to live in. And we lived in McMurray for seven years. And so when I would go to work off like four hours of sleep, it was just, you know, you're falling asleep all the time wondering why. And then you realize years later, you don't know how you got through it. So... So if you had any advice for people trying to get that sleep and they're in a similar situation to you, they have kids on the go and they're just battling that uphill battle, what would your advice be? Go uh, Looking back, I would say setting that schedule and routine and then actually sticking to it because I, I, I love kids and I love our kids, but they like to push the limit. So if you if you let them uh, even have a, you know, they're, um, yeah then then it's really hard so that's something that took us a while to learn and a while to kind of enforce and so once we were able to just get that routine going it was a couple painful days maybe a painful week but after that it just became easier and easier and then we were able to sleep and then you look again you look back and you're like how did I ever get through that so. that makes sense um, how did you the two of you meet like what's what's the backstory to that <laughs> So uh, we were both in McMurray. Um, I 
got a security job site um, on site where Rob worked. It was LB and Sands at the time. I lasted a day out um, at the security gates. And then my manager came and said, hey, you're just not cut out for this. I was 18. Um, and I'm like, no, no, please take me. Like, I don't, I just can't. I'm going to have to quit. Thank you so much for having me. This isn't working. She was like, no, actually, we just got a dispatcher job come up. Would you like to be a dispatcher? And I'm like, I don't know what that entails. Sure, I'll do the training. So I did six weeks of training for that. And then that's how Rob and I met. Yeah. And after Kayla left, uh, we started dating. And Yeah, I quit a year later. And then we started dating like a couple months after that. And Then we had kids a year later. So it was a very quick uh, succession. And then, yeah. yeah, and we lived in McMurray for, for seven years, our first seven years together. And then we moved down to Beaumont. So. Yeah. So. What was your favorite thing about living in Fort McMurray? Community. Yeah, it was pretty because yeah. a lot of people in Fort McMurray are not necessarily from Fort McMurray. Like a lot of people are from Edmonton, Calgary, mm -hmm. West Coast, East Coast, wherever. So You're you fine. had that like other family because everyone's kind of in the same boat. Whereas here, for example, a lot of people grew up and have their family networks. And so it's just not quite the same. Um, and then obviously not commuting because, I mean, I love my work, but the commuting is the most difficult aspect of it. And uh we, you know, not commuting there, even though, so uh, where I work is about 45 minutes north of Fort McMurray. So you, you take a bus or drive and 45 minutes. I mean, there's that commute in Edmonton as well, but you know, it's, it's not the best, but not the worst. But when you're completely away for a week, like now it's, I look back and I'm like, you know what? That was awesome. Just being in town. So. So what does meditation look like for each of you? Like, because meditation is different for people. And I find that the more that I share what a person's individual practice looks like the more accessible it becomes for the people who are skeptical about it oh i was so skeptical when i first got into it uh, i think one of my coworkers, justin's like oh man you gotta try meditation it's a great way to calm down i was like i don't need to calm down don't tell me what to do <laughs> so you know and i was I, I think our life was starting to get extremely stressful at that point so i was i was starting to kind of start getting these panic attacks and i didn't know and i'd never been an anxious person and just everything was getting out of control so i was like i gotta try something um so i just downloaded headspace and i would just you know they say not to do it to go to sleep and i was like again you're not gonna tell me what to do this stuff's fake anyways so i lay down and i'd like go to sleep doing it so the first couple months i did it it wasn't really true meditation but it was what worked for me and it, it did slow down kind of the monkey brain they talk about you know where your mind's just because my mind was bouncing 24 7. i'd wake up and i'd in my to-do list it would just be like boom and i'd just jump out of bed and do it and as I got on and started buying into it, I think you could say, I did more of the headspace and just kind of progressed to where you didn't really need the prompting. And then lately, uh, like for Christmas, I got Muse, that, uh, the, head, the, the sensor for meditation, which I think is really cool. And now my meditations often are just in pure silence, even with no uh, prompts or anything. And I've also uh, dove recently into some of the Joe Dispenza stuff, which again is is very different. And, and I was kind of skeptical, but it's just it's a it's a different type of meditation that kind of just brings me to a different place. So I'm open to a lot more now. So I'm kind of just experimenting with that. But still, my standard meditation now is either very little prompt, but it took me three or four years to get there. So and and I think at first I was trying to force it, like oh I need to do this. My mind needs to be clear. Why isn't this working? But it isn't like that. You just, every session is different. Every day is different. You just kind of got to go with the flow and it, and it leaches into my normal life. Cause I notice when I stop meditating, my stress levels go up. Oh yeah. Well, what about you, yeah. Kayla? Um, for me, I'm still on headspace. It's just, I have control over that. I guess when I get up in the morning, I can just find one guide at meditation, whether it's three minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes. Um, and then I just, Turn that on, sit on the couch while I wait for the coffee um, brewer to warm up. And yeah, I'm I'm still on the headspace, but it works. That's what works for me. That's what I'm going with right now. It helps get my morning started before the kids wake. So, yeah. So we're going to have some listeners that don't know anything about Brave Fox Coffee. And I want to start this off by saying like, or asking, I should say, where did that name idea come from? Like what inspired that name? That was probably one of the harder aspects. So once we were making coffee for our friends and family, we're like, yeah, we should make it. That'd be 
cool. What would we call it? And we just sat there on the couch throwing names back and forth. And uh, I think we're just Googling something. And so Raposo is Portuguese and it means basically translates to Fox. And then we just Googled Maynard, which origin goes back to some sort of translation to Brave. So Maynard Raposo, Brave Fox. That's how the name kind of came in. And then uh, one of my friends, uh, Chris, I just sent him a message. I was like, hey, we're making a coffee company. Can you send me a fox? So our original fox, he just, he hand drew it and finited it. And that was their brand up until our, our recent rebranding. So it was, uh, yeah. That's awesome. <clears throat> so tell me about what your life would be like without coffee. Oof, that'd be a, <laughs> yeah, coffee's always been a big part of, well, big part of my life. Uh, I definitely roped Kayla into the, the coffee world. So my mom at a young age was like, we were always drinking coffee. Like I think in junior high, I was, you know, a double shot of espresso in the morning and then going to school. So it was always a part of our life. And then it wasn't until a coffee shop opened in McMurray. It was, was it Clearwater Coffee? And this guy actually sat down. It was like in the back of a bike shop, you know, those kind of coffee places. He, he sat down and actually took time to kind of teach us about coffee. So we'd go in there just for a coffee and they serve Transcend Coffee, which is, you know, amazing roaster out of Edmonton. And then we started actually learning about coffee. And that's when I was like, holy, okay. What I thought I knew, like, I didn't even know that coffee is a cherry. You know, the beginning of the seed is a cherry. So, I, like, that's, I, I didn't really know. And then as you dive into the subject, it's just so broad. And that's why I think I like roasting so much because there's so many variables to it that it's a science as much as it is an art. So it's, it's something that you can definitely teach, but at the same time, like people have to be kind of, yeah, you have to just adjust and learn and go with the flow. And I know that we talked about this before, but um, what has been your proudest moment as a coffee roaster? I, w I would say probably seeing our coffee at Sobeys for the very first time. Yeah. It's kind of like that, holy, have we, have we quote unquote, this? is this like the yeah. is this what it's life and uh, yeah it was it was just amazing and they were so helpful there that it was something we thought was never possible i think kayla went in and talked to the owner brett and was just like hey so if we wanted to get our coffee and then he was like yeah absolutely we can do that you just need to do this this and this and so and we didn't realize that it was even a possible thing it was kind of just one of those like yeah let's go ask if we can sell our <laughs> coffee and he was like, yeah, let's get your coffee in here. And it took us a while because, again, we were learning. And every week we'd see him, he'd be like, you guys getting your coffee in yet or what? So he was instrumental, I think, in, in us taking it to the next level because we started with a very small roaster then another one. And then we finally went to our industrial roaster that we have now. And, and that was a lot of because we had the opportunity to get into that store. So. Well, it's cool because I think a lot of people take for granted the fact that if you don't ask, you don't get. And like yeah. the only difference between somebody who has like done it and the person who hasn't done it is the simple act of like doing it. Absolutely. And that's what and and that's something that we go with all the time. So when we first started, especially on social media and everything, we'd see all these other roasters and they were full time and they were going crazy getting in all these places. And we're like, how come we aren't doing that? what's going on? Are we doing something wrong? And then we're just like, wait, did we even try? Did we even ask? Did we even attempt? So now our rule is don't even, don't even second guess or think about it unless you've actually tried. And if yeah. you've tried, well, then that's when you can start doing some constructive criticism. But if you haven't, then that's the first step. <laughs> what are some other like coffee brands that you really like look up to or admire or enjoy? So Transcend was for sure the one that we were like, okay, this is amazing. You know, they're just, they're very unique, very original. They've been around in Edmonton for such a long time. Um, and, and they were just, you know, really influential in the, in the coffee scene. So um, they were probably the, yeah, the first specialty coffee that we really absolutely loved. And uh, Rogue Wave is awesome. Those guys over there are really cool. You got a great thing going on. Um, well, yes. They're very cool to watch. Yeah. And that's kind of, that's what we like is like the smaller roasteries that have a lot going on. Obviously when you go to Vancouver, you know, or a major place like that, there's a roastery kind of on every, on every street. So it's a different, different world, but if you can kind of hone in on the smaller ones, that's definitely what we like because we love roasting, but it's not the only thing in our life. So it is, 
Yeah. To me, that story is that cup of coffee, just sitting there and listening to them and their story. Yeah, and it gives you a different perspective, too, because a lot of the reason we do this, like, we never started this for, like, oh, we're going to make so much money and own the world. It was literally because we loved coffee. And then what we realized shortly after that is we loved connecting with people because, like we said in the beginning, people were picking it up right from us in our front door. And there was so many times where we'd just be standing there for an hour talking to this person we've never met or meeting people from social media. And it's just a, an amazing way to expand your horizon and talk to people that you never normally would have. It's so true. What's your coffee preparation process like? Like for me, I use uh, uh, the name is slipping my head, but it's the thing that filters. Up. Hold on. Yeah. That. French oh, press. There we go. There you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's uh, your so process we like? Are, yeah. We're a little uh, crazy, obviously, because of the business brand. So we, whenever I roast coffees, I put them through quite a process before I actually uh offer them to to like as our, our you know main main coffees so usually we get a coffee we roast it a bunch of different ways we cup it we try it a few different ways um and then we do pour over we do french press we do espresso we do americano we do aeropress and variations of all those in between because when you come to me and you're like hey i like this kind of coffee and i have a french press what should i get then i have a better idea what to tell you so we're constantly drinking every type and way that you can even make coffee. And yeah. That's awesome. That's, I, I like <laughs> to <good>. hear that. <laughs> yeah, it's quite a process. And that's the thing is like, I love when people email us or message us and they're just like, hey, this is what I normally like drinking. This is how I make it. Tell me what's a good option. And then I can go on and explain coffees. And that's why it was so enjoyable. Like we don't really have the time to do markets. In the first year we did, but we burnt ourselves out. So when we were doing markets, it was great because people come up to you and be like, hey, this is what I like. What, what, what would be good of yours? And you can actually sit there and explain the coffees and the origins and the, and the way that we roast it. And then I also love when people are like, yeah, well, I'm looking for this coffee from Cuba. I've never been able to find it. And if I can actually, because our supplier has access to, I think, 65 or 70 different coffees and it's constantly turning. So I can talk to him and get his advice or he can bring in those coffees. So nothing's better than when you can bring in a coffee that reminds someone of somewhere or something in their life or someone in their life, or if you can create a custom blend. So we're working with a few places right now. And again, we only have so much time and we can only take on so many projects, but the projects we like doing are the ones where it's involved with someone, they want to create a specific something. And if we can create that blend, it is, yeah, it's awesome. It's like a high almost. So with your online yeah. offerings, how does that work? Cause you guys sell online, right? We do. Yeah, actually we, <laughs> we had, uh, the opportunity to have our website completely redesigned because I tried to do everything in the beginning um, myself and I realized that I'm not a graphic designer or web uh, designer or any of that. So um, we were really lucky and Lyft Interactive uh, in Edmonton was able to redo our brand and our website. So they made it an absolutely amazing platform and we can either ship it or people can pick up locally in Beaumont. And um, during all this, we're actually doing uh, drop-offs to people. We'll just take the kids, go for a walk, and drop off anywhere in Beaumont. Um, but yeah, you can go on our website and find out more about us. And we try and put uh, information about the beans as well. Because some people like to hear a lot about it. Some people don't. But yeah, either way, you can go on, on our website there. How far away do you uh, ship? Uh, we ship from coast to coast to the States. Uh, we have people that buy from BC. We have people that buy from Newfoundland because that's where Kayla's from. And then literally everywhere in between. So it's it's kind of cool because it's it's awesome when you get orders from you know different random places. And now with our new website, I think the the it's just a, a, a way easier user process. Whereas the website I designed originally, it was it was confusing. So it really uh, it wasn't the best. So now it's I like the fact that people can go on and find out more, or they can just order the coffee or whatever in between. I love it. So back to meditation, and I'm wanting to dive back into the process of what first made you think, okay, I need meditation. Like you talked about how you're really struggling. Um, and each one of you might have your own story to that, but we'll start with you, Rob. Um, what was kind of going on in life during that time when you were like, okay, I, I need meditation. I'm going crazy. I got monkey brain. Uh, I think that there was just so much compounding. Like we, uh, 
I don't do we have the business yet? I, th I think yeah. it was maybe when we first started. So that was a lot of my play because I never nobody ever taught me to roast. I was teaching myself. So it was like a huge learning curve. And uh, I just started my degree and I was working, you know, working away. Uh, the kids were having a lot going on with them. And it was just so much compounding. And I never we I, were both bad for it. we never really take time for ourselves. So we were just running ourselves to redline all the time. So I started having these like weird kind of anxious moments where I'd feel like lightheaded. And then before we had our youngest, Oliver, we were going into because uh, Kayla's had some very interesting pregnancies uh, where our kids have tried to come, you know, every week. So she was like 20 some weeks pregnant and, and we were getting uh, ultrasounds every two weeks. So when I would go into the room, it would just I don't know what it was. It would just come over me and I just felt like passing out. It was like these really weird, anxious moments. And uh, kind of after that was happening regularly and certain things were triggering, I was like, I got to try and do something for myself here. So that's when I talked to my buddy Justin and he recommend, recommended Headspace. And it kind of just, again, I wasn't really a believer in it, but yeah, it really transformed everything. Have you ever had like stress that came from like your job? Like that's a high stress job. Yeah, it definitely can be. And I think that it's not necessarily calls I've been on, for example, that have affected me, it's more all of the situation that affects me. So being away from my family, uh, being in a kind of high paced environment, dealing with uh, just a bunch of different things. So it's more like the compounding stress as opposed to single incident, uh, you know, or post traumatic critical incident stress. So I, I find it's more if I can not control, but if I can do certain things in my life, I can bring those levels down. But when I let all the stuff in my personal life and all the stuff in my work life, it just becomes way too overwhelming. And again, every like everybody's different, right? So it's just for me, that's that's kind of how it goes, uh, just being in emergency services. So Kayla, for you, I want to kind of utilize your advice on motherhood and going into to pregnancy and the stress that goes with that and the advice that you might have for people who might be finding themselves getting into like their first their first pregnancy or just any part of that journey what, what's your wisdom to share um find your support system having that support system to always be there to help you move along would probably be the biggest thing um i became a mom at 21 I moved across country away from all my family. Um, I was in my first year of nursing, found out I was having our first kid. Three weeks after first year was over, I had this baby. I was all alone. Rob was working. We had zero family, hardly any friends that had kids, so we couldn't relate. Um, so she was nine months and I became a doula. So I became a doula because I just wanted to be with other moms that were going through similar things that I had to go through. Um, then we found out we were having baby number two and I went in labor at 20 weeks and got medevac from Fort McMurray to Edmonton, was on bed rest at the alley for three and a half months on and off. And then she came and she was four pounds and my mom had to fly up and live with Rob's parents who she's never <laughs> met for four months with our oldest who was 13 months when I left the one mommy and new baby came home she was now 18 months and we, Rob left and went back to work. My mom left and went back to Newfoundland. And here I am juggling an 18 month old and a four pound newborn who just wasn't developing and thriving well on her own. It was a lot. And I had to like lean on friends that became family. Um, and then we moved when the youngest was two. And then I got we bought and built a house and lived with our in-laws for eight months. And then um, having, we moved in and a month later I was pregnant again. And then we knew that that was going to be a tough one. And I was at the ALEC every two weeks having ultrasounds and um, just, and not that at that point we had to start all over again because I didn't have friends here. So I just, just finding your tribe and leaning on those people that's what gets you through. And don't be scared to ask for help. Everybody at some point needs help and that's okay. Ask for it. 
today I'm not okay. Today I'm on a roller coaster going through this pandemic with three kids at home. And so I just, I call the friends and they're like, and those are the ones that are like, we're going to get through this together. We got this. And so everybody needs to find a tribe. That's probably the best advice I could give for a new mom. So what did asking for help and finding your tribe look like for you when you first had to do it? Like some people, it's like, I could say, oh yeah, find your tribe, ask for help. And they're like, I don't know, I feel alone. So what was your experience like? Um, For me, it was when I became a doula, it was the women that I took the doula um, course with. So we all leaned on each other in McMurray. Since moving to Beaumont, I'm having a much harder time finding that tribe so I find I'm like leaning on my mom more um calling her a lot um I I'm a community bait like I like helping people it's why I started nursing it's why I became a doula um it's why I hope in the near future I'll become a child psychologist um I start block parties in our little community. We live in a cul-de-sac. So I started block parties, going around and handing out flyers to my neighbors. Um, sometimes we'll just have neighbors over for wine, or we talked about during this, maybe at some point we'll pull our fire pit out to the front of the, our front yard and just like inviting neighbors over. We were supposed to meet for a book club, a, a community book club a couple weeks ago, but that clearly is now canceled. Um, just, I think you have to dig deep and you have to be okay with who you are. And that takes a lot sometimes I find to find out like I'm okay with who I am and, and that's what matters most. And then going out and it's hard. It's so hard to get out of the house sometimes, especially when I'm here alone for a week with the three kids, but just walking to the park with the kids and seeing another random mom there and just going over and saying, hello, how are you today? And that converse, that little hello sometimes sparks this big conversation. And before you leave an hour later, you just feel okay again. What's your favorite thing about living in Beaumont? Because like I've been to Beaumont a few times. It's one of the most beautiful towns near Edmonton. Like I like it. It's it's just got this good vibe to it. But what's what's your guys' experience with Beaumont? I think I think it's pretty awesome that it is a small town or well city now. But uh, it's also right beside Edmonton, but it still has its own thing going on. So it's nice. You know, the uh, schools all have French immersion, which is awesome. So our girls are in French immersion. But if for some reason that didn't work out for them, they just need to hop over to the class next to them that's English. So it doesn't have to be a huge extension for them to, you know, get, learn the second language. Um, it's a little bit quieter. Um, and, you know, it's just... It just has a good vibe, like you're saying. We really like it. And it just so happens that it's close to the airport, which is pretty awesome, too. And we were able to build our, I guess, you know, just about dream house, uh, you know, with an awesome gym in the basement. And the kids all have their own rooms. So we were, yeah, it was just uh, in a really quiet, really quiet area. So And it, it was lucky that we built the style of house we did because we were able to put a coffee roaster in the garage. So, you know, it, it, it worked. It, it's like it all was meant to be, right? So... What has being parents taught you guys? Well, actually, no, we won't go with teaching. We're going to go with like, what have been the biggest moments of joy that you have experienced in your journey so far as parents? I would say that when you see your kids actually taking what you've taught or been like, you know, telling them, because if you ask them to clean up and, and do certain things and be respectful, they aren't say in the household, but when they're out in public, and they're actually going to help people. Someone falls down and gets hurt and they immediately do, you know, what we do for them or they extend those same, uh, you know, kind actions. When you, when you actually see that, you know, all the, all the yelling and suggesting actually works, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. So, cause it, it, that took a couple of years before you actually saw it. Cause you just, you're wondering what you're doing right or wrong, or when are you going to see what they actually turn out like? So it's, I like that. What about you, Kayla? Um, I I think it's a different thing for me. Um, just because our little guy, since he was really little, I've been able to tell something was not quite, um, I guess we could use the word normal about him. I knew that we were going to have lots of challenges. Um, and just 
seeing him thrive and like all the hard work that we have to go through as a family and what he has to go through on a daily basis to just be able to like be okay out in this big world like sounds were hard for him for a long time going to the grocery store walking through the double doors was a big thing where he would just like we'd walk through the first set of double doors and then the second set I'm like we're here we got this and he'd lay down and just cover his ears and say no and when he couldn't talk and all he could say was no and I just would scoop him up and be like what is, well what am I doing wrong like I have two other kids and they're thriving and I know you need something from me but I can't you can't communicate right now so just being able to get the support that we needed for him and through our his team it takes a village and just being able to lean on his team and finding the things that what works for him and what doesn't and watching him thrive in his atmosphere whether it be school or he's four and he's just starting to interact with his peers now seeing those like little things they all add up and just the work the hard work that we have to put in and the fight that we have to get through to get the support and the funding and the at like knowing which avenue to go through and finding the right people and the right team it takes a lot of work and knowing at the end of the day when we go to bed and I'm like he did this today and he was able to do that today and it's because of the team that we have behind him that's helping us get through that's what helps me out a lot yeah we've yeah. seen some massive, yeah. uh, massive progress with uh, with our little guy and and being able to like Kayla said access the funding and the right people and and the team he has at school it, it, it's amazing because if this would have happened last year it, I, I don't think we would have been able to survive. I don't know what we would have done. And so for this to happen now, obviously never a good time for and, the pandemic. But, and uh, letting your kids know that it's okay to not be okay. It's okay. Like just sit and be with. Just sit and be with each other. And if you brush your teeth today and that's all we got through, you know what? That's a win. We're together and we can just tomorrow's a new day and we'll get through it then. So for any parent that's just starting, say they were where you were last year and the pandemic hit, but you know a full year of life experience ahead of them. What kind of advice or what kind of like um, encouragement would you offer them? Ask for help. Yeah. Ask Don't be afraid to ask hard. for help. And then, and then when dealing with our healthcare system, you got to... Kinda, you have to advocate yeah. for, for you and your kids. Because if you're just passive, then, I mean, your doctors, psychologists, psychiatrists, they only know a small piece because they only hear what you tell them. And if you go in there and you're extremely stressed, they might only see that side of it. So, you know, you really have to advocate for what you think is right and then use their knowledge and what you think and your gut feeling and, and what you do to try and get, uh, I guess, the results or the help that you need. So, because it's not the easiest system to navigate, especially with, with younger kids but what we've seen is that if you can kind of intervene at a younger age because as kids grow so much of their personality and behaviors are, are more and more solidified so if you can kind of get in there at a younger age it's it's amazing the results you can get so. and you guys talked about like the team the village that that sense of support and guidance that that you had um what does that look like whether it be in the school or outside of the school uh, so in the school, we're really lucky because uh, Oliver has some funding, which allows him to go to school four days a week, half days. His teacher and EAs and OT and SLP, they're all amazing. The team that they are is, it's amazing seeing, again, like if you flash back a year ago, it's its amazing to see how far he's come. He's so excited to go to school. Like he was pretty, he was really upset when school was canceled. Our oldest was happy, but he was upset. And uh, and just seeing all of those interventions where I think if this was a couple years ago, I would have been like, no, he's fine. He doesn't need help. Uh, he's, he's only young. I don't think you can help young kids. Right. You got to wait till they can talk more. I just had all these assumptions. And I think now, especially with the stigma slowly peeling away from the mental health aspect, it's nice because I even find myself more willing to accept and, you know, experience some of the help that we've been able to get. But at the same time, yeah, it's just we've seen it. And then when we take our foot off the gas and don't do the routine and don't do the stuff they recommend, you see him totally regress. So the hard work that we put in is every day Kayla's 
doing certain activities and, and uh, you know, certain actions with him just, you know, to, to help him along. So it's a lot of work, but so worth it. That's really cool to hear about. And like, I think it's good to sort of outline the importance of, of everybody that makes a difference, whether it be like, th- there's a lot of teachers that are at home and it's not their choice and it hurts to be away from your students and it hurts to be away from the people that you have an impact on. But then I I happen to have a lot of teachers in my circle, like half my family are teachers, a lot of my friends are teachers. So they listen to this and this might be the pat on the back that they need in a time where they're really struggling. Like they're away from the people that give them that sense of purpose where, where they're helping people. Are there any yeah, teachers they, that really stand out to you guys? Like that, that I would have, say like our, our kids have all had at least one or two teachers that have completely changed their lives. So Charlotte and Oliver have both ha- both had the same uh, is it preschool, yeah, preschool teacher. And, and you'd think preschool, what can they really do? Oh, they can do an amazing amount in that year, especially at the early development. So they were both lucky enough to have uh, uh, Mrs. Winters and she pretty much changed our middle and youngest. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's amazing. And, and same with our, our two daughters, they've had teachers that have basically been able to take the extra time and address their specific learning needs. And they didn't need to, they didn't have to. And they went completely out of their way, giving extra and doing extra and actually making them have a comfortable learning environment, which it just pays dividends as you go along the years. Because I think if we wouldn't have addressed these issues, we would have been having some serious, I mean, we would have been going down a different path with them. I'm a strong believer that early intervention is key. Um, sometimes we just have to swallow our pride because we're not quite there yet with where our kids special needs are. It takes a long time to come to terms with my kid has sensory processing disorder, or I always thought maybe he was autistic. And to even have to say those words out of your mouth, sometimes it, it takes a lot. Okay. So he, I think he has this, but I'm not sure, but I want to hide this because I don't want to tell anybody because I'm scared. Um, and then you come to the terms of you grieve because you're like, he's, my kid's not going to be what society says is normal. And you, everybody wants that their kid to be normal in whatever, whatever that is. Um, and then you come to terms with, we need, we can't do this alone and we need help and that's okay. And we had to go down a few avenues to find the right path and the right support, but you have you have to advocate for you and your child and that's what it comes down to and early intervention the earlier you can find that help and the right team it just pays off tenfold like today our oldest is nine and her grade four teacher called and she was like you're not answering my emails and i said to be honest when i open up those emails right now i just sit and cry because i miss them being in school and it's a trigger for me so i just been avoiding your emails (laughs) And so she called and I'm like, what are you doing calling me? And she was like, I've been worrying about your, Mia and I just want to check in on her because her anxiety has been up and down. And um, I was, and we sat and chatted for a half an hour and then I checked in with her. I'm like, how are you coping? How are you doing? And she said, you're the first person who said that since I saw my coworkers on Monday. And I'm like, well, every, everybody right now is going through similar things. Like, you're calling because you're a teacher and you're worried about your student, but I'm also worried about you and how you're juggling and handling this. Like you're behind a screen teaching right now, so I can't see your emotions and I don't know what's going on behind the screen, but you know, just we're all in this together. And if you wanted to call and check on her and I can check on you, let's work together. And yeah. It's- so I think in today's uh, instant gratification, social media driven world, I mean, we all get caught up in it in different times, but it's it's hard or it's easy to think that you're doing the wrong things in whatever aspect of your life, be it business, personal, fitness, you name it. So, you know, they always talk about the Instagram highlight reel, and that's really what it is a lot of the times, right? So you kind of got to pull back and realize that it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to not be okay. It's okay to, you know, make mistakes. And, and it's also okay that if you just start up a business, for example, it's not going to be for having like guys that have been doing it for 10 years or that have something else, you know what I mean? And it, and as, uh, oh, 
we were going to see Gary Vee tonight. But anyways, as Gary Vee always says, he, he says, uh, you don't have to be the number one coffee roaster out there to actually make it. You can still, you know what I mean? You don't have to be the number one parent out there to actually make, you know, there's so much more to it than just trying to be number one and nothing wrong with trying to be number one, you know, but it's, it's just so much more to it than that. Well, it's true. I was listening to one of my friend's podcasts yesterday and they were going through something that really resonated with me. And it's basically like, you can, you can chase instant gratification. You can uh, try to recoup lost money in times of struggle, but the thing that matters the most is like your integrity and how much you care and your connection with people like for there's a ton of people with with struggling businesses right now and like the best thing that they can do is just genuinely have the desire to help like uh just actually want to have a purpose in as many people's lives as as what fits them in where they are but just have that genuine desire to help because it's that like connection with people that really uh helps you go forward because at some points like somebody's somebody's going to need something that that person offers like say that person makes shoes and that person was like hey how you doing and that person makes shoes and nobody's buying shoes but that person checked on all these people um when that person has holes in their shoes they know where to get the new shoes from and same thing goes for for coffee for training anything it's just like integrity and character and just uh being a good human really pays off. I agree. And that's, yeah. that's something that we really try and define ourselves with. Cause like I said, we only have so much time and you know, if I was doing this full time, it'd be different. I'd probably be out there chasing every, every, uh, every business. But for us, we want to work with people that connect with us, that have the same purpose, that have that genuine desire and passion. Right. So when we work with different places, it's we're different people. Um, you know, we, we like working with people that are not just in it to make a buck. You know what I mean? There's just like, obviously everyone is in business for a reason. You still need to survive, but like you're saying, the integrity and the, and the morals and ethics, those are, it's just so important to everything in life, really. Well, it's like you can, you can build trust and it takes years and years to build trust, but it takes like 30 seconds to destroy it forever. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, And that's what I think is interesting about some of the companies during this whole pandemic is you're seeing some of these companies step up huge. And then you see in some other companies not. So it's it's interesting. I think, it, you know, a crisis will show a lot about a person so and a business. Yeah, no, it's, it's crazy just seeing everything unfold. And yeah, it's so true. It's just showing, it's basically breaking people out into the open and showing what they're made out of. Like, are they Absolutely. made out of uh, heart and compassion or are they made out of, like fear and um manipulation and just it's it's a yeah. crazy world it is absolutely and you're seeing all of it right you're seeing people focus their business needs on making hand sanitizer which is freaking awesome and you see people going to make uh, ventilators these 3d printers these engineers they're focusing on that kind of stuff and then you see the scams and you see people taking advantage of it and you see uh you know all that like people hoarding and, and marking up and and doing all that crazy stuff so you see all of it but i i've been trying to focus on the the good stuff because it'll just crush you if you focus on the bad stuff like we don't keep the news on right now and usually i'm a news junkie but no not now yeah it's so true yeah. well i mean it's it doesn't matter what life throws at us is kind of what we put in front of us that uh, can position how we're going to go into our day because you can you can always find somebody that has it worse doesn't matter how bad you have it there's always somebody with it worse and so it's just like how are you going to frame your your place in life right now and move forward or just be one percent better and it's it's not going to happen if you're feeling too sorry for yourself you can like sit in the shit for a little bit but unless you're willing to like turn things around and like formulate how you are going to move forward from there it's just it's not going to happen like it sucks because this is a time where a lot of people are under stress but like being mad about that won't do anything so like now more yeah, than ever control it. <laughs> yeah like now yeah. more than ever gratitude is is huge which is a great segue i'm going to ask you each individually what are you grateful for list off three things for me i'm definitely grateful for being with my family right now like it is, it, it's as much as this sucks. It's also nice to have the the kids home all day to spend time with them. Absolutely grateful for that. I'm grateful for the fact that we have a really great living situation and 
are still able to operate our business and and offer something to somebody. And that's our hope right now is that if you can just wake up in the morning, have a nice cup of coffee, that'll make you smile because there might not be a lot of things that make you smile right now. So, And I'm really grateful to work in the industry I'm in right now because I'm in oil slash emergency services. So it's a, it's a difficult time for all that right now. So I'm really grateful to have a job, to be honest, because I know for everybody right now, it's, it's, it's a hard time. Absolutely. What about you, Kayla? Um, that warm cup of coffee in the morning is definitely one thing that I'm most grateful for. Um, three healthy kids and our family the relationship that Rob and I work hard on to keep where it is, that's probably one of the biggest things I'm most grateful for. And I think it's important to sort of like share these things. Like one of my things that I'm lo- looking to do, and this will be a good plug for me, um, as I do these Real Talk episodes, every day is like a different topic. Sometimes it's just totally out of the blue, but I'm looking at getting people to send me like a voice memo of what they're grateful for. And then once I get like 50 submissions, so far I have about 10 to 12. Once I have like 50 or so, then I can put that together because people people can't think of what they're grateful for. Then they hear somebody else talk about coffee or they hear somebody else talk about like that their job could be on the line, but they still have it. And so they're, they're thinking about these things and it helps reveal in themselves that they also have some of those things and they can also be grateful for those things. And it's just to hear it from somebody else and not just me being like the preachy personal trainer that's all about positivity you hear it from somebody else in a different place in their life with different things going on and it's like it's like a wake-up call like oh you know it's not so bad we're gonna get through this we're gonna be okay absolutely and that's that's why i think right now i've been you know like on social media and podcasts and whatnot i'm trying to find some of like because i'm seeing people saying that they're laid off on Twitter and that they have this and that they can't get the benefits the governments are giving them. So, you know, I'm, it gives you that perspective. You're right. And you don't really think about it because you're like, Oh, what are you grateful for? Uh, I don't know everything. But then when you really break it down, yeah, it's, that's great. Well, and like, even with your coffee business, I was talking to somebody earlier today and he was like, man, I don't have the the skills to hustle like you do. Like for me, I, I do the training. I do some social media stuff. I do this podcast. Like I, any idea I have, I'm just learning as I go to just kind of utilize it. If, if you're if you can do something, do it, but do it often enough to make it a skill that you have. Just like a person goes to school for a certain credential or gets a certain certification and so forth. Like. Uh, podcasters don't become podcasters overnight they have to start at episode one stumble a bit episode 50 a little bit better episode 100 and then they're then they're doing good um yeah it's just like if we took a time machine back to when you guys were in like high school what would what would your thoughts of where you would be now be kayla high school is a different life for me for sure um i lost a close family member in when i was 12 years old in a car accident um and her death spiraled me into an eating disorder that i battled with for five years um where i grew up in a very small town in newfoundland um in the prettiest place in newfoundland actually grossmore national park right in the heart of the park so growing up there was i grew up with this same 28 kids from kindergarten to graduation like no one in no one out kind of thing um and when i needed those kids i get it we were all going through puberty you're 12 13 by the time i had an eating disorder but those were the kids that were throwing notes around our classroom about me and then one of my close friends would bring them to me and be like this is what they're saying about you on this crumpled up piece of paper and i'd open it and the things that were said about me just they didn't know how to handle their classmate getting extra skinny i'm sure like you know back then nobody spoke about those things and so that was their coping was making fun of um my sad situation but um i had two great parents who supported me and who helped me and if I did I think if I didn't have the parents I was raised with I don't even know if I would be where I am today um it took a year before my parents even caught on to like what was happening with me and then I spent 
96 days in hospital hooked up to an NG tube. That's what how I was getting my nutrients. I was 78 pounds at 15. Um, and then high school graduation, it just like I was bullied a lot during those five years. And um, with so I felt alone um, a lot. But then I had my parents who helped push me through, who helped support me, who told me I could do whatever I wanted and be whatever I wanted in this life. And um, that support from them was what I needed to get through. Um, I also like left home at 17, I graduated high school, I left home and I just haven't been back. So um, I, I, I often wonder where the people that I went through high school with and now are just starting to have babies and kids of their own. I often wonder if they think about the things that they did towards me in high school. Because I think about that now that I have my own kids. Like I, I just want my kids to be kind. Like when they leave in the morning to walk to school, I always say, have a great day, but don't forget to be the kind kid today. And my kids will come home or I'll have teachers write me emails saying, this was one kind thing that Mia or Charlotte did today or they'll race home after school and be like, mommy, mommy, uh, somebody was sitting on the buddy bench today and I went over and asked if they want to play because they were all alone. And we'll just have that moment of like high-fiving and being like, you know, I, you may have, like they might have been having a crappy recess and didn't feel like, I just don't want them to feel alone I, like I felt in high school. So yeah, I, I don't know, like I had a completely hard different high school experience than I would say a lot of people had but it's helped shape me and who I am as an adult and who I am as a parent yeah well, I mean, in the fitness industry and it's interesting insight that maybe I have that other people don't because I just I find that I get to know people really well and there's a lot of people who struggle with eating disorder that you would never guess Say somebody like that came up to you, Kayla, and was like, hey, I need help. And they just completely open up. What would your initial reaction be? To help them. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like, what would that look like? like, Just a conversation? Like, what helped um, you the most? Just having somebody to validate how I felt. I lost someone who grew up, I grew up down the street and then... One day she just left and never ever came back. And for the first little bit, my parents would just, because we had counselors come in from wherever, whoever, because I grew up in a remote area. So um, they would come out of school and they'd come there and they'd do their practicum and then they'd leave. And then another one would come in and then another one would leave. And then, so my parents were just like, oh, you know, we'll just throw her into therapy, she'll be fine. Well, no, there was much more to it than that. Um, And how does a 12 year old child get used to like just warming up to someone and then have them leave and then have to start all over with somebody new as if it was like nothing to any adult and I was like basically not eating and screaming to them saying I want you to just be okay and talk to me about how I'm feeling this is how I feel like why would anybody listen so if someone came to me um listening would be the first thing that I would do for sure I like just that. sitting with them telling them that it's going to be okay. It's going to be a hard road, but you're going to be okay in having support, someone to listen to. That's all we need sometimes. Yeah, that's why it's nice that society has kind of lifted some of the stigma around like psychological services, for example, because it is amazing. Like for some people, it might take them two sessions and they feel better. It, I mean, some people might take them every week. It, it doesn't really matter, but I'm glad that it's not what it used to be, right? So Absolutely. it's. it's way more accepted now and and everybody in our family sees somebody and i'm not ashamed to say that at all it's Mm -hmm. it's helped all of us in in different aspects well something that i always outline and i outline it often because sometimes you need to hear things several times it's just like there's personal trainers all over the world there's like people that are in leadership positions that they have a therapist as part of their team um some people just need to talk to a lot of people just like for me like i have pivotal friendships in my life that they just need to be there. Like if, if I wasn't able to talk to them, I don't know where I would be. Like I, you need like a community, you need your people to lean on. Yeah. So it's good to have those people that can keep you in check too, right. And tell you when you're uh, doing good, doing bad and, or just listening. Absolutely. Um, Rob, what was your high school experience like? 
Uh, I had a pretty good high school experience. I would say I was probably pretty stupid from 16 to 18, you know, involved in uh, lots of lots of bad things and just just being uh, kind of a, a stupid teenager. So I guess in retrospect, I can't say that I wouldn't have done all the things that I did, but uh, I think it shaped uh, what I appreciate and who I am now. So I'm glad I got it out of the way at 16 to 18 as opposed to, I know some people who went to university and then started, you know, not being the smartest and then spiraled out of control. And then uh, if you do things when you're an adult, obviously there's other implications than, than, than when you're a teenager. So um, yeah, like, I, I mean, I had a good friendship base. I, I grew up in Edmonton. Uh, I, you know, I still talk to a lot of the people that I, that I went to school with. So uh, I developed a lot of friendships that have lasted basically, you know, for forever. But uh, yeah, it was uh, it was an interesting experience. So I, I guess it could have gone it could have gone many different ways. So. Would you have ever expected to be like a parent at this age? Have a coffee roasting business at this? No, age? nothing. Nothing I envisioned ever turned out. And that's something else that I have realized is that just because you have that dream doesn't mean that it is the be all end all again. Like I was, you know, saying earlier, like, Oh, I want to be a firefighter. I can only work for Edmonton fire. There's no other place to work for. It is a pretty awesome place to work for all the guys that work there. I'm, I'm kind of glad that it didn't cause I wouldn't have met Kayla. I wouldn't have had her kids. You know what I mean? So me going a different direction, nothing wrong with that. And, uh, I think that's same with our business and, and our kids and just everything in our life. Right. We've, even um, a corporate takeover that I experienced two years ago at work, we, we were devastated and our life changed pretty dramatically, but it gave us perspective and it, it taught us to do a lot of different things, you know, to different investing and, and just a lot of different personal things. So it's, you know, the bad things aren't all, uh, you got to take from it what you can and you got to just keep moving because like you said, you can, you can sit there and wallow in pity for a little bit, but then you got to get up and, and make it work. And whenever I'm really feeling down, I usually turn on some David Goggins. And then get uh, get myself sorted out pretty quickly with with that guy, or I'll try one of his workouts and then just crush myself, and and uh, that usually helps for me, anyways. Yeah, I'm yeah. a huge fan of him, but uh, you know, everybody well, needs different motivations. He's definitely like one of those niche people. It's like you either like him or you don't like him. Sort Absolutely, of thing. yeah. I, I love what he's got to say, but I also like hearing it kind of blunt and and hard. So. <laughs> Um, so if you guys were to give one piece of advice on how to live your life authentically to the fullest, what would your piece of advice be? We'll start with you, Rob. Live your life to the fullest by being most authentic. Is that yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I would say you just have to accept who you are and what you want to do and create a path to doing it no matter what people say, because... People said that I couldn't get the fire department. People said that I couldn't start a business. People said that you're having two kids too young. You know, whatever it is, it's great to have people's feedback, but at the same time, you gotta be who you are and be okay with that. I know it's easier said than done and it takes a while, but if you start practicing to accept and not really, you know, kind of push out what people say, it becomes common practice for you because really in the end, everybody's going through something and oftentimes the people that throw stones are going through something themselves. So it's, uh, you know, I, w I would say that that'd be the best way to do it. Just you know, be who you are and, and keep pushing forward. Your turn, yeah, Kayla. For me, it's the same. Like you have to dig deep and find out who you are. And I think all the experiences I've gone through in my short 30 years on this earth, um, is life is very, very short. Um, also, just other people's opinions are just other people's opinions. And that took a long time for me to figure that out. And often when someone's being shady towards you, it's because they are they have their own insecurities. There has nothing to do with you yet. You just dwell on that or you just focus in on like, why are they being like that towards me? I'm being nothing but kind towards them. And so often those types of people have their own insecurities and it has nothing to do with you. Um, and just fear, having like fear is okay, but like, just riding out the fear and at the end of that is like your goal and where you want it to be it's it's that's okay too um just also for me i feel just waking up every day and being like i have this amazing house i have three healthy kids 
I have a partner who supports me 100%. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's that's where I am. That's Just, awesome. Yeah. So thank you both for joining me today. This has been an awesome episode. Thank you for having yeah, us. It's our pleasure. I get to have a lot of really cool conversations and the, the more time that I have to do so, the more conversations I can have. So if you are someone who enjoys listening to the Lifestyle Chase, the way that you can help the Lifestyle Chase grow is to share the episode with a friend. Um, you can share it on your social media and just listen to other episodes. There's nearly 200 episodes between the Lifestyle Chase and Real Talk that you can listen to that uh, cater to all kinds of different uh, careers, times in our life. It teaches you that you can relate to so many more people than you thought that you could before. And the Real Talk episodes are an array of different topics. And it's honestly, it's me taking you through things that I'm going through that I hope to be helpful for you. We have a challenge of the day, uh, an episode challenge, and it's what's the biggest obstacle you've ever overcome and who helped you? So if you're interested in participating in the challenge, go to my Instagram page for the podcast at The Lifestyle Chase and comment on that post. The post has a, a caption on it that says your episode challenge. Um, if you're interested in me, what I'm all about, I'm Chris Little. I'm based out of Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, personal trainer by day, podcast host also by day. And you can find me on Instagram at Christian Little and my website, www.invigoratetraining.com. Thanks for listening. Catch you on the next one.